Come on down. Come on in. I'd like to welcome everybody to the Bible class this evening. There were handouts. I had the handouts back there. Uh, we're going to pass them around for tonight. My little outlines that I do. I'd like to welcome you if you're online with us. And thank you for joining us. Tonight we're continuing to look at the idea of how we respond in crisis situations in God. So it's about the... <laughs> you know what? I, I'd rather hear noise of kids, man. That's good. <laughs> so looking at crisis and the Creator. Crisis or emergency or, or stressful situations that we're going through. Now this series was done during the, the peak of the pandemic. So some of the applications are very specific to that time when it's going through, but I think the whole real idea is no matter where we're at, no matter what we're facing, there's problems. There's crises that are in our lives. Um, and tonight we're looking at worry and anxiety. I think that's one of the biggest ones that all of us struggle with. There's many things we struggle with, but I think we all struggle with uh, worrying and having anxiety towards things that are going on around us and the effect that it has on us. So tonight we're going to be watching that video if uh, we're not on Facebook, Facebook changed their settings, so there's something going on that they're very famous apparently for this. I've learned this from other creative um, makers that Facebook will change their parameters when you're the connection with your live streaming software. So I don't know if Facebook is up. I had to modify and do it a little different way, so we'll see if it is. I'll check on it, see if I can get it going. If it's not working. So if you have comments, questions, concerns, you know, please go ahead and jump in. I've got the chat up. I can interact with you there. I think this is a really good one that every one of us have something to bring to this conversation. So this is about a 20-minute video, and then we'll have enough time to have some good discussion afterwards. So let's go ahead and let's watch the video. We are living in strange times right now with this COVID-19 virus. People all around the country are confined to their homes. It's difficult to get certain supplies that we need, like toilet paper. More and more people are being diagnosed with this virus each day. Some are even dying. Friends, in light of these things, many people are experiencing a great deal of anxiety right now. They're worried about what's around the next corner. Now, with these things in mind, we thought it would be a good time to study what the Bible has to say about worry. So, in just a moment, we're going to see what Jesus says in Matthew chapter 6 about the subject of worry. I heard a story about a man who worried all the time, and not only did he worry, he worried everyone else with his worries. He couldn't sleep. He couldn't eat, he couldn't work, he couldn't enjoy time with his family. All he could do was worry. One day, however, a friend came to visit him and noticed that he didn't seem to be worrying. He was whistling, he was happy, he was singing, he was just carefree and happy. He seemed like a new man. His friend was so taken back by the change, he said, I've got to ask you, what has changed in your life? You used to be uptight and you worried all the time. What's different? The man said, well, I don't worry anymore. He said, you see, I have hired someone to do all of my worrying for me. His friend said, wow, that is great, but that must be really expensive. How much does that cost? The man said, $100,000 per year. His friend said, $100,000 a year? You don't have that kind of money. How are you going to pay him? The man said, I don't know. I let him worry about that. <laughs> Time Magazine called worry one of the most widespread and debilitating ailments of our time. A medical doctor said that worry is sand in the machinery of life. Someone else stated that Worry slows us down and reduces our effectiveness in all that we do. It hinders the development of relationships and takes some of the sparkle out of our personality. An unknown poet wrote, Worry is an old man 
with bended head, carrying a load of feathers that he thinks is lead. All right, let's begin our reading in Matthew chapter 6, and let's see what the Lord has to say about worry. This is Jesus, Matthew chapter 6 and verse 25. The Lord says, Therefore I say to you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air, for they neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of much more value than they? Which of you by worrying can add one cubit to his stature? So why do you worry about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. And yet I say to you that even Solomon in all of his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Now if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? Therefore do not worry, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For after all these things the Gentiles seek. For your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things, but seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and all these things shall be added to you. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about its own things. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble." Now what I want to do for the rest of our time is to go through this particular passage, this particular text, and I want to draw out five points. Each point is going to start with the letter U. We're going to notice that worry is unreasonable. Worry is unproductive. It is unnecessary. It is unchristian. And then finally, we're going to talk about undermining worry. That is, how to overcome worry. Now this particular passage in Matthew chapter 6 is one that most Christians are familiar with, but I want to suggest a connection that perhaps maybe hasn't occurred to you. When we start reading in Matthew chapter 6 at verse 25, I want you to notice that it starts with the word, therefore. Now that tells us that this section is tied to the previous section. So what has the Lord been talking about? In verse 19, He says, Lay not up for yourself treasures on the earth. In verse 21, He says, Where your treasure is, that's where your heart is also. In verse 24, He says, No man can serve two masters. He says, It's got to be God or money. And then in verse 25, He says, Therefore, you see the connection? He's talking about earthly desires and possessions and chasing after money. Then He says, Therefore, don't worry. Friends, isn't it the case that so much of what we worry about is tied to money and to things and to our possessions, things that the moth and the rust destroy and cars that break down and refrigerators that quit working and computers that crash and, and we worry about money that I don't, have, uh, I don't have enough to pay my bills. You know, there are a lot of people right now who are worried about money. The stock market is on a, a roller coaster ride, mostly down, and people are worried about their finances. Now, I'm not saying that Christians should have no concerns about these things, because the Bible teaches the principle of preparation, and it teaches that we should responsibly deal with physical things. But what the Lord says is that we are not to worry about these things. You know, the word worry in the text comes from a word which means to strangle or seize by the throat. In fact, the Greek word uh, from which uh, we get worry literally means a divided mind. Someone said that concern becomes worry when we fail to relate the situation that confronts us to the source of sufficiency in God. Another man said, he said, to worry is to assume a responsibility that's not necessarily ours to assume, failing to recognize that God is bigger than any problem we might have. 
The same Greek word for worry that appears here also appears in Luke chapter 10 and verse 41 where it describes Martha, you know, Mary and Martha. It says in verse 41, this is Jesus, He says, Martha, Martha, you are worried and troubled about many things, but one thing is needed, and Mary has chosen that good part which will not be taken away from her. You see, Martha is upset with Mary because she is spending time with Jesus and listening to Jesus instead of helping with the housework. I mean, after all, she says, there's food to prepare, there is a house to clean, we have a guest. But Jesus says, Mary has chosen the better part which will not be taken away from her. Friends, isn't this story a perfect illustration of the text here in Matthew chapter 6? Jesus is saying, don't worry about the affairs of this life. Seek first the kingdom of God. Isn't that the same thing that he told Martha? All right, Matthew chapter 6. Point number one that I want us to draw from this text is that worry is unreasonable. Listen to what Jesus said, verse 25, Therefore I say to you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat, what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? In other words, Jesus is saying when it comes to earthly treasures, God has already given you two of the greatest. We have life, we have a body, you know, it's like a person who owns gold, but then he worries himself to death because he doesn't have a container to put his gold in. You know, who gave you the gold? Don't you think that you can afford a box to store it in? Who gave you life? Don't you think that He can give you clothing? It is unreasonable to think that God who gave me life can't give me clothes. And then beginning in verse 26, Jesus gives us two illustrations of why worrying is unreasonable. He says, look at the birds. They don't sow or reap or store away in barns. They don't worry about uh, where their next meal is going to come, in, come from. All they do is fly around, they look for food, and God makes sure that they have it. Have you ever seen a, a worried bird? Have you ever seen a bird rubbing its wings together and, you know, pacing around its nest saying, I don't know what I'm going to do. It's a tough economy out there. It's hard to find a good worm these days. <laughs> now, I I'm not trying to make fun of it, but, but the point is this. It doesn't happen. God provides for the birds, and then He says, aren't you a lot more valuable to God than the birds? And the flowers of the field, verse 28, He says, look at how colorful they are. Look at how pretty they are. These flowers are indisputable evidence that God knows how to take care of His creation. And then He says, you're a lot more valuable to God than those flowers. Friends, the fact of the matter is animals don't worry. Trees don't worry. Plants don't worry. There's only one thing in all of God's creation that worries, and that's us, human beings. Now, somebody says, well, God didn't design animals to worry. You know what? He didn't design us to worry. That's why when we worry, it negatively affects our bodies. That's why when we worry, you know, we get stomach uh, ulcers and we get stomach aches and we get headaches. Proverbs chapter 12 and verse 25 says, anxiety and a man's heart weighs him down. Point number one, Jesus says worrying is unreasonable. Number two, he says that worrying is unproductive. It doesn't work. It is useless. It's like a, uh, a rocking chair. You've got a lot of activity going on, but you don't go anywhere. You don't make any progress. That's what worry is. It doesn't change the situation. It doesn't change yesterday. It doesn't affect tomorrow. All you can do is make yourself miserable today by worrying. Listen to verse 27. Jesus says, which of you by worrying can add one cubit to his stature? Now, Jesus here is talking to short people, and he says, which of you by worrying can make yourself a little taller? It doesn't work. It just doesn't take place that way. It's 100% unproductive. Now, I want you to listen to this same verse from a different translation of the Bible. Another translation says, and which of you by being anxious, it says, can add a single hour to the span of his life? 
You see, it's phrased a little differently here. You know, some people worry about their health. They worry about how long they're going to live. I read about a denominational preacher named R.C. Trench. He had a terrible, irrational fear of becoming paralyzed. One night at a party, the lady sitting next to him heard him muttering to himself. He said, it's happened again. I've lost all feeling in my right leg. The lady leaned over to him and said, if it makes you feel any better, that leg that you've been pinching is not yours, it's mine. <laughs> well, what's the point? Worrying won't make your health better. As a matter of fact, it might make it worse. It's not going to make your life longer. As a matter of fact, it might actually shorten your life. Here's number three. Worrying is unnecessary. Listen to verse 30. The Lord said, Now if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is, and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will He not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? In other words, He's saying this, Since God knows how to take care of the birds of the air and the grass of the field, then what makes you think He can't take care of you? New Testament scholar Leon Morris put it this way, since God takes such good care of the lower orders of creation, God will certainly take care of the crown of His creation. I like that. You know, it makes me think of a verse from earlier in this chapter, Matthew chapter 6 and verse 8, the Father knows what things you need before you ask Him. The Father already knows what my need is, and He's so in tune that He's tending to the needs of the birds and yet I'm going to sit back and worry that my needs might not be met? Arthur Rank was an English executive who decided that he would do all of his worrying on one day each week. He chose Wednesdays. And so whenever something happened that gave him anxiety and annoyed his ulcer, he would write it down, he would put it in his worry box, and he would forget about it until Wednesday. The interesting thing was that on the following Wednesday when he opened his worry box, he found that most of the things that had disturbed him in the past six days, they were already settled, and it would have been useless to worry about them anyway. But you know, for many people, worry is the diet of their day. They are plagued by the what-if problem. You know, what if I have a car wreck? What if I get laid off from work? What if my house is burglarized? What if I get cancer? If I have a good job, I worry that I might lose my job. If I have good health, I'm worried that it might not last that long. If our children have left the house, we worry they might come back. And, and so from breakfast until bedtime, some people's lives are characterized by worry. For some people, their biggest worry even seems to be that they can't think of anything to worry about. Do you know anyone like that? You know, most of us can identify with the woman who told her doctor. She said that she has to be seriously ill, and she named the, the disease that she suspected she had. The doctor told her it can't possibly be that disease because that disease isn't accompanied by any discomfort. She responded, That's
it did not have to go up there and reset. Other than just turn it on, it would, it would, it would not connect. Yeah, so, oh well. No, that's all inside. Oh, okay. Yeah, she's got the VMIC. Recording so it can stream later, or? No, when it crashed like that, it stopped. Um, if, it, if VMIC's locked, um, it stopped recording. It just locked. But if sometimes we've lost the stream, and it'll keep recording. And then I, then I can take that video. We could keep going, in other words, and then I could just upload the video. And then it, you lost the live stream side, but apparently if VMIX completely crashed and it stopped the recording, went to... Um, Maybe it has something to do with how it's choppy, too. I don't know. I have to look at the crash reports. Um, this, this is, no, because these are completely different systems. So the glitching there had to do with more of the buffering of the video coming into this computer and then how it was talking up there. Um, so that, that's a, that jerky stuff there is something completely different from the system up there. Now it does receive the video, so it's possible that it's coming out, but that, that's not the same video even that goes into the YouTube. So it's a separate stream. Um, yeah, Paul just commented before it locked up. What did he say? It locked up. Um, <laughs> um, yeah, he just... I don't know. I mean, I, I could go up, I guess, and do it. I guess I can. Let me see. Hey, Suzanne, can you hear me? You are actually live on YouTube. Oh. Oh, so we are. Yeah, I turned it back on, the streaming, and it turned right back on under anxiety and worry. Wow, it made the connection back. So that's why Paul, okay, Paul. Well, I'm glad we weren't bad now than everybody out there on YouTube lad, huh? Like, oops, that's awkward. <laughs> well, okay, hey everybody, welcome back. That you weren't gone, that's kind of awkward and you don't know it broke, well, okay. That's all right. I think you got the gist of the conversation and what he was talking about when it comes to anxiety and worry. And this is a passage that we, we I think all, most Christians have become familiar with in Matthew chapter 6, 25 through 34. And, and we hear this, and the concepts, again, sometimes are easier than to then put them into practice. And it's because life is testing us all the time. We walk out of this building, and immediately somebody might try to pull out in front of you, or something happens, and, or you go home, and you got a message on your phone about some problem that's going on, or you watch the news, and something blew up, or something happened, and it just, all these things happen to us. So we're living in a very dynamic life. It's not steady. It's not sterile. It's constantly changing on us. And, and that's the world. Now, you know, it comes back to almost the idea of, I think, of the way people try to make these excuses about um, blaming God. If, if God is all loving and so powerful, why in the world does he allow such evil things to happen to good people? And, and then sometimes as Christians, you know, we, we shove that aside. We go, okay, well, no, 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 no. I, I, can't, I can't think that way. That's wrong thinking. But then, you know, there's times where we are experiencing problems in our lives and we go, where's God? And you're a little embarrassed to kind of say it, but I think we've all kind of had that feeling. Or we start to look at what's going on and we try to inject ourselves in and try to take control like he was talking about, trying to feel like we can go in and do something about it. Now, there's a difference between, you know, worrying and evaluating what your problem is and doing what you can. And it's not that it's, it's something that you, you just kind of like live life like driving a car with your hands off the wheel. No, we still have to be engaged, we have to be involved, we have to be thinking, but there reaches a point where we have to understand that first and foremost, God is in charge and then we have to let go of it. We have to turn it over. And there's some very great points. The five key points, you know, you brought up about worrying the way he presented this lesson was unreasonable. That it's, you know, it's, it's not reasonable because when we look at the idea of our life and what does our life consist of? So what does our lives consist of when we're living every day? Some like a little louder, John. It's get loud. 
Yeah, so they can hear. We're live streaming, so we could hear you fairly good last week, but just a little low. But I just said vapor, like our life is like a vapor. Oh, like a vapor, yes. But in our existence, day to day, what goes on? I mean, what are we? What what consumes us? What are we doing? You know, what's what is it that's happening to us that draws us into those thoughts? My dad used to tell me every day, whatever we do centers around our stomach. If you see some people running towards the east, other people are running towards coming from the east towards the west. If you stop them, you see that they are looking for something. And that thing ends up around keeping their body alive like something to eat. Even if they're going to work, they need money to eat. Whatever they are doing, it centers around keeping themselves alive. Mm -hmm. And keeping the body alive is making sure there's something in the stomach. <laughs> I mean... Uh, so without God in your life, let's just remove God from the equation. Let's all become a pagan. What's their purpose? What's the purpose of life? Survival of the fittest. Survi well, survival, right? I mean, so what do we need to survive? Remember the hierarchy of needs? Yeah. Remember that? Money and food. Like yeah. It starts out with, you know, security. I mean, if we don't have a layer of first food, shelter, security, before you can go up in that hierarchy of needs, you're not going to go on a vacation to Hawaii if you have nowhere to live and you have no security. So the only way you can get to a certain point. So it's like we live in this hierarchy of needs. Like what? I can't remember the, the person who made the theory that talked about it. I mean, it's not concrete, but it does make sense that you know people who are struggling, they can't move on and, and progress. But their life is driven around the fundamental idea of survival. Survival. Now, survival to some people have become very easy. I was raised in a house where we had food. I never knew that my father or my mother were they struggling or whatever. I, had, I got up and I had food. And my mom had clothes and we were going by clothes. So I had clothes. I had security because I lived in a house. Uh, I lived in a country where there was no criminals going around shooting or robbing people. So I had that. I had that. That was a given. I, don't know, I didn't know what it was like to not have those things. But there are people who live in countries where they don't have that. Every morning they wake up, it begins. They have to look around to see what threat there is. They have to think about where am I going to go get water? Where am I going to go get food? How much food do I have? You know, is it perishable? How long is it going to last? And it's all around that. And at the end of the day, if you have enough food and your belly's good and you're safe, then you can rest. And if you have enough time, you might go out and kick a coconut around and play fun and have something to do and relax, have recreation. Then you move on. And now if you have a big cave or, you know, house that's got a lot of food and big thick walls and you're safe, well now guess what? We might go down and sit around and fish a little bit because there's no threats. So we can have a little more pleasure. So we, we progress in a very rudimentary level. And I know I'm not, I'm just saying, so when you look at the world, it's about survival. And then it comes into the survival of the fittest. I mean, if I'm stronger than you and I need food for my family, sorry, John, you know, I'm, I'm going to take it from you. Maybe you'll get it from me, you know. So there's a layer of that. That is selfish. So you see, all of those fundamental drives of the human body, the nature that we have within us, outside of God, and remember that, I'm in the containment of outside of God. Then it's all about me, my family, and trying to provide security, food, shelter, and then, if we have time, we'll have some fun, pleasure. In some societies, they're so wealthy that they can spend more time out mountain biking and doing different things and, you know, have pleasure, a lot of pleasure. And they forget about security until somebody blows their house up. But they don't have anything else. And that's, that's where, when, we, when Jesus in this teaching, I think, in Matthew 6 here, when he talks about this, about not worrying about your life and what you will eat or drink, or your body, or what you wear. That is talking about the fundamentals. That right there 
is what the human basically thinks about. About what are we going to eat, where are we going to get good water, and what am I going to do to protect myself and clothe myself? Because from the beginning of the first sin, what happened to man and woman who knew themselves naked together, but what did they do? They clothed themselves. They started protecting themselves. There's that. So those are the very, it's interesting. Here's God's son, who is the creator himself. The very first thing he does is takes it into the human nature and says, this is what is natural, but not for God's children. That's what he's trying to do, is to teach that. And that's why that therefore is so important to bring and not just take 25 through 34 and try to say, oh, well, it's a nice little thing about worrying and anxiety, but put it into the conversation. And so that's why you need to understand verse 19, verse 21 and 24. And he's talking about treasures on earth. Then he talks about where your heart is. Then he talks about who are you serving? Which master? They all come back to what? The material things that go back to that verse 25 that says about don't worry about your life, what you'll eat, what you'll drink, and what your body will wear. It's kind of so crude and simple. And we have made it so much more complex. And so we're, we're especially in America, in a lot of wealthy countries, we're worrying about things that are almost ridiculous to a country like people who live in Vietnam or countries in Africa, countries in, like in the, middle, in the Middle East. And we're worrying about, we think we're insecure, we think we're suffering. So it does become kind of relative, I mean, in perspective. And that's where the bigger picture is to keep it into perspective with God. We, as God's children, are not like the pagans. And that's what he said. That's what they worry about. We don't. We don't worry about that. And so we can look at nature and we can see things that, that are being provided for. And if you go out in the desert out here, you see the horny toads and the little lizards. When I'm out there riding and it's 110 degrees and I'm looking at those little lizards out there and I'm wondering, where are you drinking? It hasn't rained. We get seven, eight inches of rain a year, and it's in the middle of July, and we haven't even started our monsoon season, and those little guys are running all over. And they're just, same with the birds. There's all these birds out there. And, and that's why, that's what helps me, honestly, is to look around in some of the harshest environments, and yet you see the animals that survive that and are being taken care of, and do well. I mean, population growth. I mean, they're not, and like, I love these little, it sounds a little silly, but we don't see any of these animals in nature sitting around worrying about it, do they? And that's where I, I come to this, I'm going to jump to the other one, is looking at the idea that it's unproductive. It's actually counterproductive. I'll go even further than that. Because one, most of the times, the things that you're worrying about even if they do come, it will not even look like what you're worried about. It'll be something completely different. And maybe we all ought to get us a worry box. I kind of like that. Write out your worry. Go put it in a box. Come back in a week. And you'll probably pull it out and go, what, what was this about? Oh, you just laugh. I mean, maybe you won't. But that is a, a point that's very important. When we talk about our health, um, one of the things I did was working in emergency services and looking at the impact of adrenaline and how as a paramedic and how it affects us and looking at the hormones of stress. I ran across this book by Dr. Sapolsky, Sapolsky, Sapolsky and he did a book on, it's, it's a great title, Why Zebras Don't Get Ulcers. And he did a study on a tribe of he did a study of different clans of baboons in Africa, and he was able to, I don't know how he did it, but he would capture all of them, and the baboons have a hierarchy. So if you're down here in the bottom, you're the one that has to go out and take care of, you get abused, you're the worker. You, if you're the top of the, on the baboon hierarchy, you, you sit around all day. You got a maid, man. Everybody picks the flies out of your eyes, and you get your fleas, and. But the lower down, there's a hierarchy and a structure in the baboon clans. 
So he was fascinated. So what he did was able to study them physiologically and examine their blood. They, took, they did physical exams on them. And they had to do it in such a way that wouldn't stress them because that's what they were looking at. What is the impact of stress on the life physiologically? And he said it was tremendous. He said it was an amazing process that the lifespans, the health ulcers, the, the condition of those that were under the stress on the very lower end of it was terrible. The ones who are doing nothing, sitting around, just enjoying, not stressed out, they're living longer. He said a few years later after he left Africa, he got a call from somebody that said, hey, you need to come back. Something has changed radically with that clan that you were studying. So he flew, he got back to Africa. There was a village that started living next to the clan. And they then started going and getting and eating from the trash. Well. What happened was they got a disease and they got sick. Well, the lower run guys, they didn't get to eat the food because you know what? The guys on the top slapped them in the head and said, give me that rotten banana. And so they were eating all the food and they all died off. So the whole clan structure flipped. The ones who were in charge ended up dying because of the disease because they were dominating. And all of a sudden now you have those that were down in the bottom tier we're now ones running it. And he said it was incredible to watch. The same process started happening with their health getting better. He said that, but what was very fascinating was they did not repeat the behavior of the previous organization where you had the top dog beating everybody else up below them. No, he said they were treating each other good. And he said their health was improving. And then they started watching because one of the ways genetically they keep from having compromised genes and things is clan males, young males, would come from one to another. What they wanted to see is if they bring one from a traditional clan where they are treated in a certain way, come in and integrate, were they going to modify and cause the, the whole new utopic clan to all of a sudden change back to the old cruel hierarchy of, you know, kind of cruelism? And no. That they said the baboons that would come in and start trying to act like the way they did in their own clan got beat up. And so, no, 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 no. It was like they were saying, uh uh, no, this is the way we do things here. And so, his, his thing was looking at the stress hormones and the health and the different positions in life. And he said, and he saw that, that coming across in healthcare and looking at, um, and especially like in Britain, there was different organizations where everybody received the same health care, but in different layers. And so he said, depending on where you were at in different organizations or stress, your lifespan was shorter. Even your genetics, there's ways they could see that your genes would unravel, your aging was accelerating. Moms with handicapped children have a, a very hard on them, the stress hormones that hit them. And then he brought it around and talks about how, and I know this is going long, but I think it's important. And I think because God knows what he's doing. He said, now, let's just sum it up in this. He goes, if you ever watch a zebra, and he said, get chased by a lion as he was going down to the watering hole. And the zebra is running for his life. And his body is just flooded with that fight or flight. And so he is flying and as soon as he gets over and he's safe, he doesn't sit underneath the tree and go, man, what am I going to do tomorrow? Oh, no, man, that, that big bad lion is still down there. And now, you know, I'm going to have to go down there. He said they forget about it. It's done. And their body goes back to an equilibrium and the hormones are gone. He said, no, he doesn't. He's not a really a religious guy. So he says it this way. He said, humans are the only mammal on this earth that can imagine a threat and recreate it physiologically and stimulate their body as if they're going through it. There would, there's no difference. You may not literally be chased by a lion, but the thought of it terrorizes you so much that those hormones are flooding your body and having the same impact. And what does these hormones do? They shut down non-essential functions in the body. So what's non-essential? Well, if you're running for your life, guess what? Your digestive tract is not really important. Because if you're not going to get to eat tomorrow, it doesn't matter. So you better survive. Also, your immune system. 
because it doesn't matter if you have something that's get, needing to be healed, because if you're getting munched on by a lion, who cares? So that even all resources, in other words, are depleted and focusing in on very emergent type of processes in the body, which then impacts our ability to heal, our ability to, you know, be healthy. So when he talked about this, and I know I'm really going deep into this, I have seen this. I have seen this in medicine and looking at this study. And so when God says these things to us about not worrying, it's not just because Dad says don't do it. And I just want you to be happier. It impacts the length of your life. It impacts the quality of our lives. But we have to learn to master them. That's, I think that's one of the biggest problems we have, is how do we master them? Um, and, and so these other ones, when he says they're unnecessary, and that the one of them I'll hit, and then we're going to move a little along, looking at how to undermine worrying is about the idea that it's unchristian. Because I have been asked by somebody that was very sincere. They were a big-time worrier. They confessed it. <laughs> you know, you could see it in this person's life. They worried a lot, and they were a Christian. And they asked me the first time that they asked me, said, well, is it a sin? And I said, I tried to be real nice and all that. And I was like, well, you know, and I, I kind of, you know, softened it up and didn't want to be real insulting. And about five years later, they asked me that again, and I looked at them and said, yes. Yeah. Now, it doesn't mean you're going to be successful, just like sin. We're not supposed to sin, right? We're not supposed to sin at all. But John says, and God says, no, you're going to fall. You're going to. So it's not that we're never going to be we're free of worrying, but it is wrong for us to worry because it does express, I think, a lack of trust. Because that's, isn't this exactly what he's talking about in Matthew 6, 25 to 34? All, everything he's seeing there about the idea of what are we looking at? Compare ourselves to everything around us. And so I do. I think that it is a problem, and we need to think about it. Do we really believe somehow that God has forgotten us and that God can't take care of us? I think it's hard. It's hard to overcome that. So let's focus now in on some of the things, the way we can you know, undermine it. And this is a verse, again, verse 33, seek the kingdom of God. So what does that mean to you guys, since you guys are here? <laughs> when it says seeking the kingdom. Like seek the character of God. Just so what is the kingdom? Oh, I think absolutely, I think seeking the character is really a great way because when you're looking at his character, you're looking at how he acts, right? How he handles, what he does. Um, but this is more of a, I think of a, an idea of a part of what we are a part of. We're a part of this kingdom. Or the goal, like keep your eye on the, on the prize. Mm -hmm. The kingdom of God, like, like you're almost there. Don't give up, keep enduring. Like Paul constantly went through tribulations and constantly told us almost every pistol, we are to be in tribulation and we are to build each other up, to endure and to give each other our worries and to give God our worries. So I believe this word is just to help narrow this out also, is that this is the church because that is a word that we see used by the apostles in the letters where the kingdom and church are being used pretty interchangeably. And so when we think about this as seeking the kingdom, now not the, the totality of God's kingdom and there's different ways we can go on to kingdom, but specifically, I think he's talking about the kingdom that was coming, that came. And so that, if that, that's the church then, if you're seeking the church, um, does it stop when you find it? You know, I mean, there's, there's a lot more that word seek when we look at the back ground of that word when we talk about when you're seeking something and desiring it what's the you know that's where I think when you say seek the kingdom first and all everything will be added to you if you don't know what that means 
you don't know how you do it. And I think it has to do with all the, the quality. Let's, if we go back and look at what the body of Christ is, we have to go back to like Corinthians and go to 1 Corinthians and look at 12 when he talks about the body and the different ministries and the different miracles and things that make up the body and the purpose of the body. And every part is a, is a part that is working with and nurturing to build up one another. So there's a mission within the church. And so that's what I think you're talking about. If we become so focused on taking care of one another, being a part of the church, ministering to each other, focusing on you and you, and if you're focusing on me, and we're teaching each other, we're growing, and we're helping others, we're trying to take the Word of God to them, so focused on that, then he says, I'm going to take care of the rest. Let me take care of everything else. My church is my bride, and I want her to be presentable to all people, and she needs to be busy. She needs to be working with one another, helping each other. And that's where I think that getting involved in the church. And so seeking the kingdom of God first really brings a bigger importance of our role within the local congregations as well. Um, and so that's, that's spiritual things, in other words, in our lives, where I think that's a foundational problem we have is not seeking that. The other thing is keep it in perspective. You know, we, take, we seem to take big chunks. You know, and take one day at a time. I can't do anything about something that's going to happen in a year. You know, I can work on it as I go. Um, Aline says the church is part of the kingdom we know we experience first. And so all the parts that we have that we experience in the church, our fellowship, the building up, the edifying, the loving, all those things, and the evangelizing, teaching, taking the word out. <clears throat> yes. So one day at a time, um, I think that's something that's really hard as well because we're, we're wanting things to happen so fast and we just can't. Little kids, their timelines are so rapid, aren't they? I mean, they're, it takes, are very slow because it takes forever for their birthday to come. It's like forever. You drive across country. It took us 10,000 years. You know, I mean, it's everything to them. They want it now. But as adults, we do the same thing sometimes. We're, we're trying to expect things to happen so fast. We have to slow down and, and just take them. And that's what in verse 34 he's talking about. The other thing is we have to really give it to God. Um, I like some of the quotes. You know, to worry is to assume a responsibility that's not necessarily ours to assume. It's God's. Because he said he would take care of those things for us. You know, those are things that we could do. And 32, I think, verse 32 here kind of hurts because it says all those things that we're worrying about, those are things that non-Christians worry about. Well, that's they, one thing. When I find myself worrying, it's how much, how much should I listen to the TV today? Like... And then I realized, oh, I caught one glimpse of a podcast talking about, like, the war going on or whatever, and it conflicts with what I heard last week. And then I start worrying, well, what, what happens if this happens? And then, and then I get back to calming down because I started teaching myself to call, I call it Instapray. <laughs> and even if it's just saying, God, <laughs> like, like, help me. Because uh, that's sometimes all I can say. And then I start calming down because I'm just like focusing on, mm -hmm. even if I'm just quiet and I'm like opening that that prayer window. I don't, I don't know what you call it. Like you're just like sitting there and you're in the midst of praying, but you're silent because you're just like feeling the presence. Like, or not the presence, but like you just, you're just waiting for a response, even though you know it's just going to be like, just calm down. And then it's, the sense starts coming in and going, I've spent way too much looking at podcasts. I probably had too much coffee this morning. I probably should eat something. And I start making sense and calming down, knowing, and also the rear view mirror that you keep talking mm -hmm. about. It's easy to 
look in the rearview mirror, but I go, okay, now put that ahead of time. I'm able to sit here peacefully and look at where I've had anxiety, where it almost choked me to death, and and remember it can be handled. Well, I, I think that that is a real good. I think a a, a good way of um, seeking the kingdom is there's so many good podcasts. Like one of them I've been listening to is Bible Project, mm -hmm. and they're doing a series through the uh, Torah, mm -hmm. through Exodus, through, and he's going through and, and talking about Moses and. So I had to go down to El Paso for Suzanne's car to get the oil changed down there at the dealership. So I had an hour down there, and I got there at 7.30, and then you leave till 11. I just sat there listening to that, and I was just like, it was so wonderful. Mm -hmm. I, had, I wasn't listening to all the garbage. And then to listen to somebody with a mind like that, with the Hebrew and the Old Testament and some of the things, and I came back, and I'm listening to it all the way home. And I felt, what a productive day. And I, but I was stressed out because I'm like, oh, I need to be studying and working on slides and doing this. But man, those are the ways we can seek is edify ourselves, nurture our own spirit. Because that will help shape us into his image and make us more productive. So first step in seeking after the kingdom, I think, is seeking after the knowledge. Yeah. And there's so many wonderful resources out there. You know, if you have problems reading, you can listen to the audio book. There are different things you can listen to. If you're a video, visual type of person, there's a lot of really, and if you don't know where those resources are, let me know. I'll get you some really good ones that you can listen to instead of listening to all this other crazy stuff. I ran across a guy who has a YouTube channel that he mows grass. Oh, yeah. I've seen that. <laughs> For free? Yeah, for yeah, free. I've seen that guy too. I swear he has the same algorithm. Yeah, he, he goes around, he knocks on doors, and he goes, I'll mow your grass. And I was sitting there working <laughs> on my computer, watching this guy mow grass. Yeah. 30 minutes, and he's, and I'm sitting there going, what are we doing? Exactly. I want you to guy yeah. mow grass. But that's what I meant to say. Yes. Is, so we can waste our yeah. time instead of flipping over and listening to a good discussion. You know, about God's word and helping to build me up. I'm watching some guy mow yep. grass, you know what I mean? So what are we doing? And I think that's a part of, if we're seeking after the kingdom of God, that's what he's saying. And let, let the Father take care of it. Because that's what he said. And if you want evidence, go outside and look at nature. Mm -hmm. That's and what I meant. What time, what do, where do you fill in your time with mm -hmm. is really important. And that's what he says, you know, I mean, like he, he quoted uh, Leon Morris, you know, kind of the idea that if God is taking care of nature the way he does and all the animals and the fish and everything, and they're not even his crown jewel, we are. We are. We're his children. And if he's taking care of them, then we know he will take care of us. But we have to give it to him. That was the third point that he had uh, Dean had about giving it to God let it let it give to him you know it's and it, it's hard as it is and we'll do it we'll give it to him and then it's almost like we go back and knock on the door and say you know can I have that back <laughs> I, I, I need to worry a little bit more about it um, I had a friend of mine that used to say I know absolutely worrying works and I said how he goes because none of it ever happens the way I thought about it or sometimes it doesn't even happen. So it must work. And I thought, oh. I thought I was going to have. Isn't that true? Yeah, I thought I was going to have a heart attack with my worry because it would get my, like, I couldn't breathe. Mm. It felt like somebody was staring at me. I, that's the first time I actually saw the meaning of what worry was. And I was like, wow, that actually. Around the throat, huh? Yeah, I was Isn't like, that that's what it is. <laughs> I like the other one, the Greek on worry was double mind. Yeah. Because what happens? I have you have one yeah. mind that's worrying about all these things going on. And see, it goes back to the stress hormones that I was talking about, the zebra thing where, you know, what are you doing? You're sitting there imagining all these things. You know what you do when you do that? You're stimulating stress hormones that's affecting your immune system, that's affecting your, your body. So while we have this double mind, one mind that's trying to live, and we got all this other mind over here just going crazy, we're, we're impacting our health our mental and physical health. And I think that's a part of the peace that God wants us to have. Is, and that's why he says, you know, giving it to him. The other thing is, keep it, verse 25, you know, he's saying, keep it in proper perspective. What is really valuable to you? 
So the Gentiles, they have nothing else except for filling their belly. Ungodly people fill their belly, make themselves pleasure, and enjoy whatever they can. That's all they can get out of this world because that's all they have. We have something greater, and that's what we should, we should really be focusing on as well. To get out of this world. <laughs> well, and you know, I mean, worst case scenario, when they kill you, guess what? You win. Yeah. <laughs> you win. That's what I, I, I what like. Paul said, it. right? Yeah, it's like our mission is to get off this world, but, you know, get through the tribulations and grab as many people with you on the way out is how well, I look at it. Isn't that what Paul's kind of saying when he goes, you know, I'm torn between yeah. whether to stay or to go? And if I go, I win. If I stay, then what's he doing? He's seeking the kingdom first. And he's not even quoting Jesus, but he's seeking it when he says, then I'm here for you. I know it's funny in Timothy, he's like, finally, like the crown is made for me. <laughs> I read it like that. He was, prob he was probably a little saddened, but the way that he talked about what you're talking about when he said, finally, I have a crown made up for me. Mm -hmm. I read it like, finally. <laughs> well, that's why keeping it in perspective. You're going to die. Sorry. Nobody's making it out of here living in this body. Your body. You're not. So you can get consumed with the idea of how nice I'm going to look today and how good my food's going to taste and how wonderful I can do all these things. It doesn't mean you can't enjoy them. But when that's what your priority is versus serving God, and then you're, you die, you're like the fool with the barns. You build a barn up and you sit there and then all of a sudden you fool. Now you're, you're going to be held accountable and you give everything up anyway. So, Another reminder is to be content. Like all of a sudden when that rat race of life comes invading my life again, whether it be mm -hmm. I'm not as good as my sister is compared like in my parents eyes or something like that mm -hmm. I go but I am content I could have less and be content yeah. I want less and my house is too big I want less <laughs> so I can be more content well let's have a prayer and then we'll wrap up um, next Wednesday there will be no class here um, if <laughs> she crying because there's no class no, I'm joking. <laughs> so, um, but there will be um, a video. There's a live streaming scheduled. It's already up there on YouTube, so it'll, it'll start at 7 o'clock, and it's different. You'll have to be surprised, but there's some really good ones. One's on medicine in the Bible, so there's some really good videos from World Video Bible and some other one's sources. So there's two of them. I'll be gone, um, and then I'll just be gone one Sunday in the middle, like uh, October 2nd. But so, but I'll, I'll see you guys Sunday. So let's go and have a prayer, and then we'll, um, we'll conclude. Our most blessed Father, we are so thankful for all that you have done for us. We hope, Father, that we had learned a little tonight about how to control our worry and our concerns and the anxiety that we face. We hope, Father, that we would look around and look at the beautiful nature that we see how you array it in such blender, splendor, and yet we know we are more important. We hope we would always remember that and that we would always desire to be at peace with this world, let go of things that are disturbing us so that we can have a freedom from the, the things of this world, the material uh, concerns. We pray, Father, that people would see that change in our lives and that we'd be able to help them to, to come to recognize you as the one true, wonderful, loving God. Father, be with us the rest of this week until we meet again. We ask this in Christ's name. Amen.